Welcome to this afternoon live session with the wonderful Mayan Chen. And I just, before anything, I want to thank Mayan again for uh, being so kind to kind of squeeze us in your in your schedule. Thank you so much for for being here with us. It's really a real pleasure for me to be talking with you. Welcome. Thank you. And I wanted to say it's such an honor. Uh, to get to know what you have done, Gabriella, in terms of your work championing for women composers, what your organization Donne has done. And I want to thank our uh, lovely friend that put us in touch, Miriam Kirby, probably watching it from The Hague. Um, thank you so much for putting us in touch. And this is um, a subject that's very dear to my heart in terms of um, championing for di diversity, inclusion, and specifically women composers. Well, I can say that the honor is really mine. Honestly, thank you so much. And then I'm sure if people are here watching, I hope you know me, Yan. So uh, for those who don't know, I am Gabriella Di Laccio. Very nice to meet you all. I am the founder and the curator of the project Donne Women in Music, which focuses on promoting uh, women in music with a um, special dedication to female composers from past and present. And we do that in many different ways uh, on a, with an online platform. And this conversation today is like my our new way to, to, to stay connected with people because it's so important, especially now when uh, all of us in different ways, we are going through different challenges. And I think uh, this is very important. And I really hope uh, you can appreciate. If you can't watch now, please share with other people because Mayan, I think, is really a treat for us. And if you don't know Mayan, she's uh, she describes being a conductor. I love that phrase, as being the music. And if you have the chance to see her live, uh, you will understand why. Or if you watch her online, I think it becomes really, really clear what she means. Uh, she's so passionate, and she's really praised for her dynamic conducting style. She's originally from Taiwan, but she's Taiwanese American now, aren't you? Yes. And uh, she's the music director, artistic director of the fantastic Chicago Sinfonietta. And we are going to talk about this today. Uh, but she's also a guest conductor worldwide. She continues to expand her relationship with orchestras. And she's also a great educator. And again, Thank you, Mayan. It's a great honor. And I'm very inspired by your work, much more than I can describe with words. Welcome to this session. Thank you. Uh, okay. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just so glad to, to put a face to, uh, you know, all the work that I have gotten to know. Um, and so it's, it's wonderful that we have this chance to get I, to know I, each other. Likewise, likewise. Well, I think it would would be very nice to before we go to into we have so many fascinating conversations we want to talk to today. But can you tell us a little bit a resume of your musical journey coming sure. from Taiwan? How did you? How was it for you? Because I know you were a violinist first and pianist. How did you transition? You know this move from Taiwan to America, the cultural shock I can imagine, and yeah. then the brave decision into going into the conducting uh, field. Can you tell us? Absolutely. I try to do a, di a Reader's Digest version of my yes. <laughs> Can I story. Imagine? You know, my, my music journey was literally my life journey and conducting really has brought me to many places to meet many people I never thought possible growing up in Taiwan. I grew up with parents and sister who love music. Uh, and my parents really didn't have chance for music education as they grew up under um, the, the, the occupancy of Japanese. And so their dream was to give their two daughters 
opportunities they didn't have. And, and I'll be honest with you, Gabby, if my mother could have been trained musically, she was definitely going to be an opera diva. There was no question about it. She's still <laughs> dreaming about my orchestra accompany her singing. I, I'm like, it's a little hard uh, with the distance and everything. And so they had my sister take up the violin and me the piano. Uh, but my wonderful sister, four years older than me, really was more of a visual artist. She wanted to create in her own space versus yeah. informing instruments. You need to share that in time with others. So yeah. I always thank her for giving me the double duties of entertaining my parents oh. because my parents thought having the two daughters take up instrument was the easiest way to have free concert at home every day. They were way too naive. And so um, I took up piano at seven, violin as, as seven and a half. And then the light bulb moment came for me when I play in the orchestra for the first time at age 10. Um, I was rather shy because, you know, my mother, between my mother and my sister, my, my dad and me, we were the quiet ones in the family. And so I remember seeing this person on the podium pulling all this sound together in the room. And that's the light bulb moment for me. I ran home and told my parents, piano and violin are fun, but I really want to be a conductor to play the largest instrument in the room. They frowned, looked worried, and they said, we don't, we did, we don't know where to, where to find your teacher. I mean, they were absolutely right. Uh, conducting as a degree in Taiwan doesn't really start until much later. And so I didn't take no for an answer. And so this is lesson number one for all those budding conductors out there listening. Uh, don't let people tell you you can't do anything because here's an example. I was 10, I was stubborn to determine to learn something that I believe was my way of expressing. Uh, without sound, uh, w without actually talking, but with as much sound as possible. And so I would show up at rehearsals having my violin part memorized, given that it's very easy music. And then I would just fix my eyes on the conductors. And he looked around. I was the only kid looking up. Uh, yeah. And so he, he thought I was the best student, not knowing <laughs> I was trying to steal his crap at age 10. Yeah, so life went on for a couple years, um, and then a youth orchestra from America, uh, from New England Conservatory, uh, under the direction of uh, Benjamin Zander, took a tour to Taiwan and Korea uh, when I was uh, 16. This is in the late 80s. And I went backstage. My, my older accompanist took me backstage to meet the conductor. I could barely speak English, but she somehow managed to ask him, could you listen to this little girl play the violin next day? So Mr. Zender said, oh yeah, yeah, come. So I show up nine o'clock at the hotel, the orchestra already uh, checked out, ready to move to the next town. The hotel was completely booked. The only place quiet enough for me to play for him was this closed bar in the basement. <laughs> so I played my Winiowski concerto, so much and from you, the heart without the piano with the smell of beer i mean nothing was ideal but he saw this very rare um rare musicality i guess you know he's he's he had seen a lot of asian students but we we all grew up with a lot of tiger moms, practice, practice. And so I wasn't practicing for my parents anymore. In middle school, actually, one of my classmates is, is watching. I got a special, uh, I got a special permission from school out of 5,000 students. I was excused from the required afternoon nap. We all need to like put our <laughs> head down for half an hour because it's tropical weather. And the practice time became mine because I feel very special. Instead of taking a nap, I got to practice in the oh library. That was like my time. And so when music became mine, there was no question about music being the, the form to express who mm -hmm. I can be, who I want to be. And so when Mr. Zender saw this in me and he saw me sawing away on Winiowski, he asked my parents, would they be willing to let me pursue 
be, um, a, a violin degree in Boston. He will try to find scholarship for me. And that was my- How old were you? I was 16. So, uh, so I, so literally that was fulfilling my parents' dream. They always wanted me to be a concert violinist. Um, and so they said, yes. And so two months later, I arrived in Boston, wow. um, not knowing, actually I tricked my parents into giving me a ticket to come to America so I can <laughs> finally learn conducting. I mean, I, I really tricked them. Um, and so I, um, I started, to do a lot of conducting in undergrad. Um, I was almost like a double major, even though there were, you know, I think at that point there wasn't a undergrad degree in conducting, but I would use my violin scholarship to, uh, to have my uh, wonderful classmates as, as the guinea pigs of my orchestra. You know, I would put Chinese Pollock out to feed them and say, come and play for me. And so I started to uh, conduct quite a bit in terms of composers needing their work conducted. It's uh -huh. always, yes, yeah, doesn't matter how terrible the piece was. That was a chance for me to get <laughs> practice on, on my own ensemble. Yeah. And so life went on and I thought, okay, um, if I've gotten double masters, one for my parent on violin, one for myself on conducting, I should be able to find a job. And to my biggest surprise, out of New England Conservatory, double degrees, I was the first to have gotten both. I couldn't find anybody to give me a, a chance to audition. And so I thought, okay, well, I need to stay in America. Um, so I applied for a doctorate. Uh, degree and I landed up in the hardest curriculum out of all my schools is University of Michigan. They only accepted one doctorate degree uh, student each year because we were given to be assistant professors leading a ensemble of our own that's comp uh, comprised of uh, musicians in non-music major uh, departments. Mm -hmm. And so we have physics, um, uh, science majors uh, that have been playing violin or instruments their whole life. They just decided not to pursue music degree. They were great players, some of them even better than the music majors. So that was my first uh, music directorship experience, having to audition the whole orchestra. There's a budget. Uh, and also what opened me up in terms of conducting was conducting opera because I really have to put myself in tune with what the singers are doing on stage and to really pull that together. So many people, you know, on stage, in the pit and being in the music. I think that's when I've merged the two personalities I had. This just really expressive way of playing the violin. And, you know, I was always very clear as a conductor before then, but it really, for me, connecting isn't about just clarity. It is about being the music, as you mentioned. So I thought, here, I've gotten all the degrees. There's the get. I've got a, you know, <laughs> a doctoral candidate uh, out of University of Michigan. And to my biggest surprise, the amount of rejection letters were more than the notes I ever conducted. Oh my so God. I almost gave up after dreaming about it for um, for 18 years. I was 28 at this point, and my parents were pressuring me to go back home to teach violin in Taiwan. Well, my sisters, um, again, being the true heroine in the story, uh, and my uh, brother-in-law said, please just um, hold on to your dream a little longer. Don't give up just as yet. And so I remember having to teach uh, 20, 20 to 40, at, at one point, 40 beginners um, on piano and violin uh, through Suzuki methods. And yeah. believe me, I love touch, uh, teaching, but if you have to teach twinkle, twinkle 40 times, I can assure you it really tests your, uh, yeah. your passion for music in terms mm -hmm. of how to make Persistency, it yeah. And so I was exhausted to try to make ends meet and I did everything. I did people's yard, I cleaned people's houses, I did videotaping for the law department. I did everything to hold on to my dream and trying to support myself. And then one day I was so exhausted from teaching 
And I was so dry. It's been a year and a half since my candidacy that I wasn't able to perform at all. Because once you achieve the candidacy, you're sort of out of the program. Oh. And I said to myself, I got to drag myself into the concert hall where it nourishes my soul. So it was second half of a symphonic concert at the Hill Auditorium. I mean, believe me, we, we have had Yo-Yo Ma twice a year, um, twice, or not twice a year, went through twice. Uh, Berlin Phil on, you know, the University of Michigan Society is very strong in bringing all these guest artists. But it wasn't even a famous group. I think it was just um, a, a university ensemble performing. And second half of the program starts with Tchaikovsky's Pathetic Symphony. Uh -huh. And this was a moment I remember for the rest of my life because I sat down, exhausted, and wondering what's going to happen to my dream, my musical you know, career possibility. And I heard the bassoon solo at the beginning of that. And I played, I've conducted before, but never before. I heard that bassoon and understood the despair that Tchaikovsky was writing um, for his own challenges in his life. And I was bawling like a kid. And it made me realize that is a privilege and an honor to have the gift to be able to create something meaningful and beautiful with others. So regardless of there was no opportunity that I promised myself that one day, if I were given the opportunity to be on the podium, I will treasure it to conduct it like it's the last time I get to share music with others. And so that moment really stay with me in the ups and downs of my career, of this passion to understand that we are giving a mission to share yeah. something that's not so tangible in someone's mind in terms of my parents giving me a hard time. You can make a living as a conductor, but I tried to tell them it was my calling to really express, to really bring others together uh, through the universal power of music. And that was the art form for me. And I was very grateful to have gone through that difficult, pet, uh, difficult transitional time. So I don't take any performing opportunities for granted later. So I'll pause for a second since you know that that was a long Reader's Digest version. No, no, it's wonderful. It's it's really wonderful. But I, you know, I I come from a very small town in Brazil as well. And I, I, I had I had the same sort of calling from a very, very young age with the most absurd background with no musicians. So I had the opposite of you. I had no push no and i have this this thing and i remember uh, watching operas he, on tv you know from covent garden as a child and having this music transporting me and and it's amazing because it's exactly as you say uh, when you have this inside of you it's almost like you have it's, it's your job as as a person in in on earth to share this beauty with others and if you don't yeah. do that you're never yourself fully, I think, as an artist. And the moment, uh, because I think we, and I'm sure you still have moments when you are down and up, we all have as artists, it, it never really gets to a point when we are all, oh, okay, now it's all fantastic. And in those moments uh, of challenge, we have this, uh, this precious gift, which is the music that we have to share. And I feel very privileged as well for knowing what I wanted to do very young, Although yeah. it sounds really crazy, you know, it's like a bit like you 10, 10 years old, I'm going to be a conductor. And you don't even realize, oh, I'm a woman and uh, I can't really see me like that out there. So it's really inspirational. So it's, I love the long version. Don't worry about it. So we're going to have to move to how did you end up with this wonderful orchestra, uh, the Chicago Sinfonietta. But if you would first, before anything, share with us the story of the birth of this orchestra, because if people here yeah. don't know, uh, I think it's uh, more than ever this week, it's, it's a fantastic uh, moment to share this story. Yes. So uh, Maestro Paul Freeman, our uh, beloved founder, uh, encountered Dr. Martin Luther King 
uh, when he was uh, arriving in Atlanta airport to uh, get ready to conduct the Atlanta Symphony. And that encounter with Dr. King um, inspired Maestro Paul Freeman to start um, an orchestra um, in the nation, first orchestra in the nation. That's the, that is mostly to champion for diversity and inclusion and to get, uh, provide opportunities for minority musicians. And so in 1987, in Chicago, Maestro Paul Freeman started the Chicago Symphonietta, and it has since been the most diverse orchestra in North America. And during his tenure, he has championed for um, a lot of minority musicians, and you can think of obviously African American musicians, Latino, Latina musicians. Um, the minority angle applies to guest artists, composers, orchestra members. We have very interesting mix of um, ethnic background, um, probably more than any other orchestra in the country right now. And also one other famous trademark that Maestro Paul Freeman was able to achieve was through innovative programming because he thought we perform at the home of the Chicago Symphony, we have to be different. And one way to attract the audiences was by doing things really outside the box. Some of you might remember reading this. I was a young uh, conductor working uh, uh, in Portland, Oregon, um, as my first music director position job leading America's oldest youth orchestra, the Portland Youth Philharmonic. And I remember reading New York Times and thinking, what a crazy orchestra. <laughs> this was before the cell phone became a household item. And the Chicago Sinfonietta commissioned a concertino for cell phone and orchestra and invited, orchestra, uh, invited audience member to participate. And that, I literally was thinking, this this orchestra is crazy. Not knowing, years later, they have they invited me as a guest to conduct a sort of an East meets West program uh, to bring to Chicago sort of um, a, a interesting version of the Butterfly Lovers violin concerto, but ha having the soloist playing on the erhu, the Chinese violin. Um, and so that was my main audition program. And, and that was the longest of long shot in terms of successors to Maestro Paul Freeman. Nobody thought that there's any possibility for an Asian woman, com uh, woman conductor to succeed Paul Freeman um, and to everybody's surprise. I mean, I fell in love with the orchestra five minutes into the first rehearsal. Yeah. It's like, wow, this orchestra is so unique. Everybody feels like family. I mean, it wasn't like business as you know usual. It was like, hey, how are you doing? You know, what, what, you know, how is, how are your kids? It's just, there's this very tight family feel that Maestro Freeman created with these musicians that some of them are still uh, founding members of our group from 30, wow. 30, um, two years ago. And so 33 years ago now. And so it, it's, it has been um, incredible orchestra uh, for me to realize the mission of championing for diversity, inclusion and equity just fall into my lap. And this really made me think of my own struggle Mm -hmm. um, my journey paralleling many of a minority musicians struggle. And I have to say that this is one of the most blessings I've been given as a musician to really find out what are minority musicians or subjects or um, genres that we could really help champion. And so leading to the historic moment of Maestro Freeman passing his baton in his last official concert with Chicago Sinfonietta. Um, and he wanted to design it as a program only featuring women composers because he felt women composers were 
still very much a neglected group of minority in our country. And we have taken that to really dream with our musicians. Yeah. What are the big dreams for our 30th anniversary? That's about you know two seasons ago. And so this idea of that's champion for Project W. Let's have women composers sprinkle. We have nine women works by women composers, uh, over five major concerts. Night works out of 20 works out of a season. You do the map, the percentage is blowing that percentage at that season. I think overall in America was less than 2% of yeah. entire repertoire performed by symphony orchestras or by women composers. So we were blowing that right out of the water. And we yeah. also found a, a wonderful partner in SETI Records founded by Jim Ginsburg, whose mother is my personal heroine, oh, you know, RBT. I know, I know. Uh, just this, her, tell her I love her. That's it. RGB. Just to prove um, <laughs> Bader Ginsburg. I mean, what are the coincidences? And so when Jim Ginsburg at Eddie Records heard about this Project W, he immediately signed on and we just moved it forward to capture uh, four commissions plus a work by Florence Price, who happened to be who became the first African-American woman composer in the country when Chicago Symphony premiered her symphony number one in 1933. And so we just thought, why not put her dances in the game breaks? Um, it, it's a, a 10 minute short piece, yeah. com consists of three wonderful dances, something that that was a, a war premiere recording. It was arranged by her uh, friend, um, William Grant still because it, the piece was written at the end of her life to capture indigenous African rhythm. And I'm sure she was capable of orchestrating it, but you know, she died of a stroke suddenly in, in 1953. And so I'm grateful for William Grant still to make this piece into a orchestra arrangement. And so we uh, recorded it. I wanted it to be available for other orchestras to listen. And if they don't have the space to program Florence Price Symphony, which is more of the 40 minutes range, they could introduce Florence Price in their community with this cute uh, three dances um, as a begin, uh, as an introduction of Florence Price. So yeah, well, I am really fortunate to, to have found Chicago Symphonietta. Yes, we will come back to uh, the, this subject in a minute, but can you just go backwards a bit? So when did you start with the Chicago Sinfonietta? Which year was that? I started officially in September of 2011. Yeah. So I've been with the group uh, for, for close to 10 years now. Yeah. So until that moment, or maybe a little bit before, when you came uh, in contact with them and Maestro Paul Freeman, how much of the female composers and all these uh, underrepresented composers and artists, were you aware in your musical education and how much becoming a, such a fantastic a collaboration between you and, and Chicago changed your vision? Or in my case, for me, it was like when this Pandora box opened for me, you can never unsee what you, right. you know now. And then you just, uh, so how was it for you? So let me talk about two big uh, fate changing opportunities for me. So um, the, the first one, I, I have to thank the Danish people. I, I feel I have adapted Scandinavian because um, I was trying to stay in the country. As you heard, I was music director of the PYP in Oregon. But I had a, a visa issue. I couldn't stay in the country after 9-11. They changed the rules for, for green car requirement. So this is true story. I'm not making this up. My lawyer said to me, man, you only have two choices. It used to be if you have a doctorate degree, you it's easy to get your green car. But now after 9-11, they make it much more, more difficult. So you either marry an American, which will get you easier, faster, green car, or you go win an international competition. And so I didn't know oh. which was harder at that time, but I went for the competition. Uh, the, 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 the husband one. <laughs> I did 
didn't have time to date. So it was like the, the competition yeah. was an easy choice. So I won for the Malco competition in 2005. I was um, uh, I was among the 30 out of 242 applicants from 40 countries in the world. I was just glad to be invited to the live audition round. There were four rounds. I went from 30 down to the final three. I could not believe it. I didn't tell my parents about it because my father has high blood pressure and I didn't want it, his blood pressure to be roller coasting um, with the competition. And so when I, when the biggest lottery I won in my life um, was to become the first woman to ever won the Malco competition. I was completely American trained. There's no European tie whatsoever. I couldn't afford to go to Europe to take master classes and, and so forth. And so this was really opening doors I never thought possible. And so here comes the next period of my interesting professional career. I, I cry for day for for weeks, giving up my kids. I have a, about a thousand kids, oh, in the world that I call my kids from the the youth orchestra time, and I really have to give that up to become assistant conductor of. Um, uh, well, first an Oregon Symphony that was. Um, at the same time as my youth orchestra, but then it took me away from Portland to be assistant with Atlanta Symphony and then Baltimore Symphony, assisting Marin Alsip um, for one year before my music directorship came. And so when I was assisting um, Robert Spano, a music director of Atlanta Symphony, and also Marin Alsip in Baltimore, these two cities have about 60% of the population being African-Americans. And it was my first time being, being connected to very different ethnic background, you know, um, in those particular cities. And so I had to research as an assistant conductor, research works that connect to that very particular uh, community, African-American community specifically. And I needed to prep myself in terms of who are, who, who have been those black composers over the years. So Chicago Sinfonietta became my number one source with the uh, African-American heritage series produced by SETI Records again. And so I've been using that incredible source. I wish we had, you know, uh, Rob Deemer's, uh, <laughs> extensive um, yes, repertoire right. work back yeah. then, but I, you know, I, I didn't have that. And so I had to uh, literally use Sinfoniata as um, a, a wonderful source. And so I was aware of Sinfoniata that way, but it really was about having the experience of working directly with Sinfoniata's team and equipping myself in terms of what's what's been done that piqued my curiosity about, well, how about who else is out there that we haven't have a chance to champion? And I stumbled onto Florence Price because my first music directorship, even before Sinfonietta, was with uh, Memphis Symphony, and we were going to do a semi-ballet uh, production. And it had very unusual instrumentation with Burnside's undertone, you know, two trombones, one saxophone. And I stumbled onto Florence Price, Dances in the Kimbrakes. And that um, also, actually, uh, at the same time, Chicago Symphony, I have Chicago Symphony to thank because Marta Gilmore, who was the main programmer at the time, invited me to make subscription debut with Chicago Symphony. Now you can see the panic in my eye when she said, man, how about Florence Price, Mississippi River Suite, since you have the Memphis connection. And I didn't, you know, that was actually the very first I have heard about Florence Price. And then that really piqued my interest into finding out more of her work and having a chance to actually start doing a lot of her works. And that jump start sort of this journey about, okay, other than Florence Price, what, who else? I mean, so we have, you know, I have a long relationship with Jennifer Hickton since I assisted 
the recording, her recording of The Singing Room with Jenny Coe, uh, Jennifer Coe on the violin and Atlanta Symphony, Atlanta Symphony Chorus. And so I asked Jennifer, could we be a co-commission to your new piece for strings dance card? And she was so gracious and so generous. And then we also find, uh, we also found Clarice, Clarice Assad, the daughter of the Assad brothers, who Brazilian. actually, who, yeah, exactly, grew up in Chicago, still now living in Chicago. I mean, she moved away and moved back. And so we commissioned her Sinfantera Without Borders for her to be able to utilize her uh, Brazilian, South American, traveling through North American, using different musical genres to create this wonderful piece on Project W Recordings. Uh, we have also found at that point, we definitely need to find living African-American woman composer. And we found Jessie Montgomery. Um, and she, uh, she wrote a new piece for us. And then we also, I befriended Rina Esmail through oh, yes. my other wonderful work. Uh, I am serving as the first artistic partner of the River Oaks Chamber Orchestra, uh, the most fun group I've ever seen in the country in terms of, you know, they work so intimately like a chamber orchestra, it, basically a chamber musicians, um, all, always having so much fun. And the founder of that group, Alicia Lawyer, who is also the principal oboe, uh, wanted to um, commission something from Rina Esmail, who, is, who grew up in Los Angeles, but with um, heritage from India and yeah. have studied in India and and created this string piece called uh, Tin Morti, really capturing more thing the traditional Indian music and Western um, music idiom. And so I uh, we included Rina's uh, Tin Morti in Project W. Uh, it was fantastic way for us to explore the first. Um, uh, attempt on Tivali festival that basically um, is the festival of lights for the Hindu yeah. um, traditions. And so um, we, we found that Project W was able to give us angle into including diverse groups of women composers. And we had a heck of time. A uh, heck of fun time and also challenging time of uh, putting very um, different but great pieces together. But basically, the recordings are captured through our RCs, and then that's why it was only released in yeah. March of 2019. But we're proud of that work, and and we're continue to do. For example, I want to talk about uh, we we just sprinkled the woman composers work across the season, but we dedicated the March program, which is the, uh, the Women's Month. Um, historically, we had a program that we just basically, the whole teams holding hands saying, Kambawa, we're gonna jump off the cliff together because we uh, titled that program, Honoring Women Composers as Hear Me Roar. And if I read you, the composers list of that program, we had to prepare ourselves that basically no one was gonna to come to the hall. So we had <laughs> four dances in the Cambrakes, yeah. Jennifer Hickman dance car uh, premiere in Chicago. Rina Esmel was writing a new work at that time. She changed the title to Me Too and we were 120% supportive of her embracing that movement. And then Dora Pejecevic, Symphony in F Sharp Minor. It was like, my, our musician was like, who's this? Dora yeah. Pejecevic is the first symphonic composer in Croatia. She happened to be a woman, only lived to her 30s because she, had, she died of complications after giving birth to her only son. And so we did, we asked our intern to do a worldwide Google search about mm -hmm. women composers. Yeah. Um, and this, this came on that radar. And I listened to the link and I'm like, wow, 
I'm hearing Strauss, I'm hearing Bruckner, I'm hearing Mahler. Who is this lady? And so when we brought this uh, to Chicago, it was 100 years since its complete premiere in Munich. Um, and it, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a daring attempt for us. And I can tell you the wonderful thing is somehow our audience trusted us and our yeah. board member used this as a, um, an opportunity to uh, pair it with her uh, woman executive um, symposium kind of thing. And we, she brought 150 uh, of her colleagues who has never stepped foot in a concert hall along with our diehard fans. We actually have much bigger, we have the biggest uh, uh, individual sale of the season that year because of this program. And I can tell you, I mean, we were ready to do art by art's sake. I mean, if it were like 100 people in the hall, we're gonna still perform that to our best ability. But to have a hall responding to us with every piece, not knowing what it's gonna sound like, and yet loving it at the end, the whole hall cheering for women composers. I mean, I still, I still could see that scene when talking about it. So I, we're very encouraged. We're gonna continue our Project W extension. That's amazing, and it's something that people ask me as if I would know because I'm, I'm I'm a singer, so I don't have artistic powers. But because of the project, people ask me this question, and they ask me, "Oh, so why why isn't this music being played in in major orchestras?" And uh, I'm going to ask you this question later. But I always thought that it would be so easier for big organizations to introduce this music as you suggested. No, take one piece and if you're doing Beethoven's fifth and then you just introduce a new piece and, and do this throughout the year. Because from my experience, since I started to including uh, music by diverse composers in my concerts, it's amazing the, the response that the public has. You know? The public wants to hear it and, and I think the fear of selling tickets, of course, we all understand that. But if you can do that, you know, I can see the excitement you had. And and I have the same one every time I'm researching new pieces because you find these amazing stories and, and music and art. And you it's almost like it's your, you have to share it. You know? So yeah. what would be your advice from, from the experience you, you have as a conductor and also as part of as an artistic director to other artistic directors out there who are afraid of challenging the audiences what is your advice or what's your first like comment to them you know it's interesting because now i have gotten um a lot of uh well, i wouldn't say a lot but quite a few engagements particularly wanting me to bring this woman composers expertise uh, to their orchestra. So my my suggestions would be, you know, find a way uh, how the Sinfonietta have done it is uh, since we only have five major programs uh, in a, each one as a pair at downtown uh, West suburban um, area, we basically craft each program to have a narrative behind the pieces to make them connect. And so yeah. I would suggest to people who are afraid out there to really be be open to <clears throat> to pro provide a, a just a small space. If it's just a five minute opener that you feel comfortable or 10 minute um, space like an overture ish, then I will I will say look what's been there, like uh, Rob uh, Demir's um, search allows you to search for specific geographic, um, ethnicity, ear, um, so many details that you can find. So if you are looking for a very specific uh, connection that you can find out these pieces and give it a chance, because I think what we learn is that if you just ask audience, what do you want to listen for? I mean, they're going to only give you pieces yeah. they know. And so it, it is our job to help stretch their comfort zone 
in a in a very reasonable pace, obviously, to 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 perhaps say, hey, listen to this. I mean, it's not the first time we have done Jennifer Higdon's piece. Yeah. In fact, I think we have done Jennifer Higdon's pieces much much more in advance of Chicago Symphony's uh, invitation of her, but we are happy for that. And so it's introducing bits of, you know, and that's why I want the dancers in the Kim breaks to be available uh, for other orchestra. So they could say, hey, this is, if you want it, for example, I brought um, dancers in the Kim breaks recently to, BB, to my debut in BBC Symphony in London. And I tried to tell them, look, uh, Florence Price actually came as far as UK uh, before she, you know, before her stroke uh, in the 50s. And when we were playing this, I got so many comments about, oh, mm, this is like Joplin, this, you know, a little bit ragtime. And they're trying to make their own sense of it and really enjoying it. And when I brought it to my new position in Graz, uh, I I'm serving as the first principal guest conductor of the recreation Grosses uh, Orchestra Graz. And I I brought to them, I said, you want um, American music? Here's one that is rarely done. And when I brought it to them and the musicians were finding ways to groove, you know, they're so good at Viennese groove and to find sort of a way for the American groove. I mean, it was actually easy for them to find that. And so I think now, now actually I get to be, I get to be asked to, ch to premiere so many women composers all over the place. You know, in Graz, uh, we will be next season, we'll be, this is even a premiere for them. We will be premiering an Austrian woman composer by the name of Johanna uh, Müller Hermann who studied with um, the big teacher at the time, alongside with contemporary of um, uh, Strauss and, and a little bit later, obviously for, uh, for Bruckner and Mahler, but you hear her hero overture that is just incredible writing, symphonic poem. And when I was talking to the, the chief of orchestra, uh, orchestra, orchestra there, Mr. Cooper, he was fascinated that his father, who was an oboist with the Vienna Philharmonic, studied with the same teacher. Might actually have known this woman composer, but her she was forgotten. Uh, basically, when the World War came, that she was just literally forgotten. And so, um, you know, I didn't really start out by saying "woman, it's my thing," but I think um, that. As musicians, I mean, as much as we love Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, uh, that is wonderful to also be the voice of the unheard. Um, you know, Fanny Mendelssohn, uh, Clara Schumann. Clara. Yeah, Amy Beach in America. I mean, there's so many women's music that reflected uh, their time, their struggle, their expressions, their hope for the world. And it's wonderful to give voices to those unheard. Amazing. Uh, I can't believe this. Um, we have 10 minutes left. I'm going to ask people if they want to ask you a question. But before, uh, while they start asking questions, you wanted to talk about some uh, amazing initiatives for female conductors as well. Yes. We try links here if you want to talk about that. Lovely. I can share them with people. Lovely. Uh, let me talk about uh, my mentor, Marin Alsop, who founded the Kaki Fellowship more than a decade ago um, to really have launched about uh, the Taki Concordia Fellowship. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, have really helped launch 20 some women com com doctors uh, career in the world. Uh, several of them are also connected to, um, there's a epicenter of women artist that's happening in Dallas. For example, the Dallas Opera in collaboration with the Heart Institute has uh, in several seasons have also launched um, many women conductors um, 
career. I know some of you watching uh, were participants of that, but also the Dallas Symphony has, um, uh, I don't, let me get this right. The Dallas Symphony has to, um, sorry, I, you may have it more the correct there. there. Yes, the, the Dallas Opera, but also I think that Dallas Symphony has produced several women con, con, uh, conductors that were also in the Taki Fellowship, but there, there's a, a woman, I'm so sorry, I don't have this memorized. There's a woman initiative that's happening with the Dallas Symphony. Uh, let me see, Women oh. in Classical Music Symposium. Uh, that's, that's happening with the Dallas Symphony. Um, and so, between all these programs has really helped women com conductors to come to the forefront. But I also like to mention Chicago Sinfonietta's own Freeman uh, Fellowship, which has produced the most number of fellows in the country uh, uh, for fellows um, that consist of uh, musicians of, um, uh, of color. And so we have instrumentalists, we have conductors, we have administrators, and, and among about 10 conducting fellows since um, we expanded to include that in 2014, we have produced about 10 young conductors out there who secure staff positions with professional orchestras. And among them, um, we have, you know, a couple women, Kalina Bovell, assistant conductor with the Memphis Symphony, Deanna Tham, assist, uh, associate, uh, assistant conductor with the Jacksonville Symphony. We have a, we have a current uh, fellow from Puerto Rico. Uh, we also have another opera fellow, she is a uh, um, music director of a small opera company here in Chicago and being a guest conductor over the country. And so it's, you know, I, I like people to continue supporting these wonderful endeavors yeah. because they are creating a safe and encouraging environment to allow this woman to find their own voices, to believe that it is possible in a yeah. bigger environment when it says it's really not possible. So yeah. I applaud for all these wonderful programs and their wrote as National Symposium for Women in Classical Music. That's the other project that we we didn't. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. Yeah, Alicia Lawyer, who is the 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 incredible heroine behind Rocco. River Oaks Chamber Orchestra literally wanted to create more opportunity for herself and also her colleagues across the, the country that she created this. So uh, my advice for young women artists, leaders out there is number one, you got to believe that is possible. Don't let anyone else tell you that it's not possible. And second, to find that passion that is so strong, you cannot live without it. As my violin teacher, Mary Lou Speaker Churchill, who was my first violin teacher in the country, who was one of the first women principals among major orchestras in America. And she, one thing she said to me is, man, you really want to pursue music? Then let me ask you, can you live without it? That was it. She didn't say, do you want to do this, that, that, that? And so I think when you have enough passion, the passion will lead you to create possibilities within impossibilities. So Mr. Zender's book, I encourage to recommend to everyone to read it. The Art of Possibilities is a in, in very inspiring book about thinking outside the box. Because in this day and age, there's no set path in any of our career. But I think to be brave, to create your own path, to find your own passion. And last thing I will recommend is your the passion that I just talked about. It's twofold. It's what you are passionate, what gets you up in the morning and feel like life has meanings. But that passion has to be big enough to impact more people. 
It's not just, well, I so love Beethoven, but how about making Beethoven accessible in whatever ways? You know, I remember Memphis Symphony did sort of uh, a Beethoven fifth, but in sort of um, a rapping kind of style with a local rap, rap artist. I mean, it's a little bit outside the box, but when you have the will, then it's possible to find ways to fulfill your dream. Wow, that's really, really amazing, Mayan. And uh, just to uh, anybody, if anybody has a question, say it now. <laughs> but uh, just before them, I think we, we, we can't not, we can't forget and to mention the, the sadness of this week and yeah. hope that we don't have to wait for tragedy or we don't have to wait for March to right. think that we should do something about diversity or we should do something about inclusion. And uh, you you are one of the people doing it all, in your life on a daily basis. But I don't know if you agree with me. I feel like the classical music world is very slow in, in embracing and I think yeah. it's not really a choice anymore. It's kind of, we, we have to do it. That's how I feel it. Because if we don't do it, it's almost like by being, by omission, you're agreeing with not promoting the underrepresented. So what else can we do? You were already doing it, but well, what I, I, I will I would love for you, Gabby, thank you so much for bringing this very key point to end our talk today. Um, I would love for you to share that graph. Maybe we'll yes. put a link for people to see. So I wanted people to see that if it's possible for one orchestra in Chicago to do this, um, the right column on your screen literally is the percentage. Um, we'll, we'll provide a link for you to see. So it's so small. But can you see that there is like one on the right column, there's one orchestra on top that surpasses everything everything else uh, um, to the bottom. That's about 58% of our programming of Chicago Sinfonietta um, championing for musicians, uh, championing for uh, composers of color, basically 58% versus, I don't know, what's the next one? It's so small, I can't see, but it's a, it's a big jump to the rest of the herd. And um, there's, so this is my, this is my way of encouraging everybody. If it is possible for Chicago Sinfonietta to have found a way to, to be relevant to our community and to garner uh, awards and, and recognition such as from the MacArthur Foundation. Um, in 2016, we were given uh, about $650,000, um, what so-called the Genius Grant to really um, recognize what we have done. And so I think if one orchestra could have done it, Please use us as an example. Yes, I included, thank you. I included the link there because it's very small to share. But please yes. visit the, uh, that amazing research from uh, Rob Dimmer and, and the Institute for Composer Diversity, which is a fantastic database for anyone who wants to expand their repertoire. Of course, come to Donna's website as well. We have the, the big list of female composers that has 10 pages, and we are currently reorganizing everything. Uh, and I cannot thank you enough, Mayan Chen. Uh, here is Mayan's. Um, website and also the amazing Chicago Sinfonietta and they are all on social media as well and please follow their work. Uh, the, the CD Project W we actually featured on Donny's website as album of the week uh, and, and you can listen and really be amazed by uh, and I'm sure you had to to leave lots of works by female composers out of the CD you know because you you probably had yeah. too too many many more to to be part of it and let me mention if you uh, if I have a 30 second you know on that same graph 
Uh, the other side is percentage of women composers being programmed. And the number one on the list was River Oaks Chamber Orchestra. Um, uh, I think it was a tie with Albany Symphony and then Symphonietta, uh, Chicago Symphonietta being number two. And so I think I find that these two organizations that I'm involved with, they're trying to be relevant for our, for our time. And I think I would encourage um, all the orchestras out there listening to have the courage, um, not only because it's the right thing to do, but really it is great thing for our musicians, our community to have a diverse wide range of composers available for them. And so I think we need to reflect our times, our communities and our music should do that and you will find reward for doing that. Certainly. Mayan, thank you so much once again. And I hope we meet again many, many times uh, uh, in person and this way as well, if we may. And thank you all for watching. And uh, if you enjoyed, and I really invite you, all of you, to, to stay connected with us as well, Donne, the project, I'm, I'm sharing the, the website here. We are all on social media as well. Uh, you know, social media now more than ever has the power to do some amazing good by all the good things we can share. So stay connected with us and follow this ama amazing work of Mayan and the Sinfonietta. Thank you again. Mayan, and I so may you. I say, Gabby, and all those of you who have championed for women, you rock. <laughs> so do you. <laughs> Big hugs. Thank, Thank you, guys. You.